Uh, my name is Margaret Dempsey Dotson. I'm an assistant director of instructional design uh, within ASU Online at EdPlus at ASU. Uh, so we are a centralized uh, service unit for the university. Uh, we work on degree programs. My team specifically works on international education degree programs and grant partnerships. So we work with academics uh, units across the uh, university as well as the faculty to build online courses. So for our agenda today, uh, we have a robust agenda. I might be a little bit ambitious to try to get through, but I really wanted to make sure that uh, we built the foundation uh, for you to uh, understand the framework of how we think of uh, instructional design and online learning and in building uh, engaging learning environments. So we'll discuss some of the frameworks that we use for designing quality experiences. Uh, designing the learning objectives, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how we develop those, uh, as well as the uh, lenses, the primary lenses that we use for building community uh, and engagement, which include building a sense of instructor presence and increasing interaction within the online courses. There's also five main pedagogical approaches uh, that we will cover as well. Uh, there are many different types of uh, pedagogies uh, and frameworks out there, but these are the five main lenses that uh, are foundational to start with. And then you may customize in, uh, incorporating further uh, pedagogical practices uh, and specific frameworks, depending on your learning goal. Uh, if time allows, I did have a, a scenario that we could practice as a group, and I uh, will try to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. And uh, just double checking, uh, I believe everybody can see uh, my screen. Let me know if that is not the case. So some of the frameworks that we use for designing uh, quality experiences, uh, we use Quality Matters, which is an internationally recognized uh, quality assurance system. It consists of a set of standards, uh, general standards, and also specific criteria. Uh, for designing online learning environments and teaching. So a lot of what we'll cover today, uh, if you were to go back later and familiar, familiarize yourself more with the rubric, uh, you'll actually uh, see a lot of what we are talking about today. It'll, it'll click and it'll make a lot more sense. Um, so Quality Matters recognizes that there's a number of factors uh, that may uh, play a role in creating a high quality learning experience for students. Uh, so some of those factors might include uh, things that maybe might be uh, a little bit less directly within the instructor locus of control and a little bit more within the student's locus of control, such as their level of readiness. Um, but if we're doing uh, online learning well, so, um, we can build some components to kind of uh, scaffold for students and kind of build some of that foundational uh, proficiency that might they might need. Uh, QM also does focus on aspects of course delivery. The Quality Matter rubric itself uh, really focuses on uh, one aspect of course quality, which is course design. And uh, the Peralta Equity Rubric is another rubric uh, that we refer to at ASU Online. Uh, so this kind of helps us in our globalized world as we're creating uh, global citizens, uh, you know, to take a look through that equity focused lens and try to make sure that we're incorporating uh, flexible framework and assignments and practice for diverse learners. Uh, that also includes their uh, range of experiences. Uh, so these are examples of some of the uh, standards that we refer to when we design for quality experiences. And uh, throughout the course of, of this seminar, I'll break down some of the components that integrate uh, or stem from these frameworks. Oop, one second, I went a little too far. There we go. Uh, so uh, the guides for how we design learning experiences include our learning outcomes and our learning objectives. These are really uh, the essential backbone of uh, the online course development because the learning outcomes are basically going to let students know what they should be able to know or do by the end of a course. And then the learning objectives uh, at more of a unit or module level will tell students exactly what they should be able to know or do and will learn through the scope of that unit or module. 
So we aim for these to be measurable uh, and achievable. Uh, so that way we can keep students focused on the right goals. And we as instructors have a way to determine whether students are truly achieving the expected learning outcomes. So when we create these uh, as faculty um, and as instructional designers, we're looking for a learning objective to basically contain a verb that represents the action and an object, usually a noun. Uh, so that's how we craft the statement. You can kind of see some examples on the right hand side. And when we uh, craft learning objectives, uh, kind of a rule of thumb that we like to adhere to is we really try to focus, and there's actually multiple representations, uh, just to kind of back up for a moment, of uh, learning objectives models or Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, there's another configuration that's a wheel. But for this pyramid uh, representation, which is a popular one, we really try to stay uh, kind of within more of our goal uh, is to really frame uh, our learning objectives within the top four uh, levels of this pyramid. And part of the reason for that is because, and I'll, uh, I think this might be somewhat easier to see on the next screen, which is a different representation model, is that uh, when we're looking at the lower levels, those are lower cognitive levels. And they're also harder, uh, more frequently to measure uh, effectively within online courses. But we can measure the top ones, which also represent higher levels of cognition. So in this version of the model, this is actually a new version that Iowa State University uh, developed. And I really like this model because it kind of breaks down the cognitive process dimension for you here on the right and how that aligns with the knowledge uh, dimension um, on the left here. So the object that we are talking about when we form the statement uh, is so that the verb refers to the action, uh, it should be aligned with the cognitive uh, process that they're supposed to do. And the object that we're talking about in that statement describes the type of knowledge that students should have. So you can see the six cognitive process dimensions here. This is just another representation of the model. But I think this one kind of lays it uh, out in a way that uh, might be a little bit more uh, understandable for crafting those types of objective statements. Uh, another practice that can be helpful when writing learning objectives is that if you kind of proceed uh, your objective uh, in your mind or even in the course, this will help students. Uh, if you say something to the effect of students will be able to, and then uh, you would add your verb and then uh, the knowledge item, uh, essentially the action that they should complete um, within that statement. I did include a link um, to uh, our ASU Online Learning Objectives Builder. So this link might actually be a helpful resource uh, at, um, if learning objectives are new to you or even to help you refine uh, if you've already had some exposure and practice with uh, writing learning objectives. Uh, you know, this can still be a good tool for some additional ideas or maybe how to rephrase things a little bit more effectively. Now, when we focus on uh, the learning outcomes and learning objectives within the course as kind of the guideposts uh, for both uh, students and ourselves as instructors, uh, we're really looking for uh, the alignment uh, between those outcomes, learning objectives, and then the instructional methods and assessments uh, that we will use throughout the course in order to provide ways for students to demonstrate that they've actually mastered those objectives. So that's a little bit of uh, kind of our uh, housekeeping items, just to kind of give you a really brief overview of some of our guiding uh, frameworks and tools uh, before we get closer to uh, digging through uh, pedagogy. So when we think about pedagogy uh, in the online space, we need to consider key elements of building community. Uh, so we focus on that through these pri three primary lenses, social presence, cognitive presence, or teaching presence, which will sometimes hear referred to as instructor presence. So when we refer to teaching presence in the online space, uh, you're trying to essentially replicate that type of experience in the online environment uh, so that you're still uh, creating a sense of community uh, for students in the course. Um, and also shaping uh, their perception of learning and satisfaction with the course. 
Uh, so there's a number of ways that that can be achieved, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more specifically in a moment. Uh, social presence is the ability for students to find commonalities with each other and engage with their peer group of learners, their cohort uh, in the course, while they also kind of uh, share and contribute to uh, their shared meaning making. So they're constructing that experience together. Um, it, it positions students uh, in the center uh, as contributors to that learning experience. So uh, they have the opportunity to explain their ideas and their individual interpretations um, of the course materials, the content uh, to their peers, and it allows essentially all the peers to engage deeply with the course material while building relationships and also kind of synthesizing those additional perspectives from their peers. Cognitive presence. Um, again, ties to the construction of knowledge. So in this sense, they're co-constructing uh, knowledge within the online space. Uh, so we're looking to develop that critical engagement with the content and pair that uh, with the student opportunities to build on their own interpretations and actions to create that meaning of the content. Uh, and that'll foster deeper facilita uh, facilitation and understanding of the topic while building community. So I want to uh, highlight some of the types and benefits of instructor presence uh, for a moment, um, because this is so critically important. Uh, there's three primary types of instructor presence, the personal, the social, and the instructional. Uh, so we'll dive into a little bit more specific examples of these on the next slide. But the personal uh, could be as simple as uh, some of the strategies that you may use when you start the class uh, with the students. Uh, at the beginning of class, maybe it's something like creating that course tour video or like a meet the instructor video. Uh, maybe you tell them something a little bit personally about you uh, that helps kind of humanize that experience and build that connection with you as an instructor, uh, kind of that uh, interweaving that thread of humanity in there. Um, the social, uh, that refers to how you guide the social experience and social interactions within the class. And we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, as well as we go, because sometimes this is also connected to the instructional, uh, which could be uh, social engagement activities that you do in terms of your interactions with uh, individuals in the class or with the group. But it can also be intentional instructional methods that you use uh, to um, maybe clarify understanding or uh, sticking points uh, that the class overall has. And we'll talk about that a little bit more specifically in the moment. But the idea behind uh, creating that sense of instructor presence is there's a lot of research out there that shows that uh, instructor presence is highly correlated uh, with creating a, a sense of student engagement, learning, uh, helping to facilitate their self-regulation and self-efficacy, and creating that sense of motivation. And again, because we're also in the online space uh, and they're more physically removed from you um, as opposed to being in the physical classroom, reduces that sense of distance or isolation. So methods for creating instructor presence, uh, these are just some samples. Uh, it's not an exhausted list, but here's some examples that might send uh, or kind of trigger some thoughts for you. Uh, it could include uh, at the very beginning of a class, if you send a welcome email, maybe through your learning management system or post an announcement uh, that basically welcomes students to the class. And um, you may pair that with the next strategy, uh, which could be creating a course video or the meet and the instructor video. Uh, this could be used to basically kind of give the tour uh, of the course to students in terms of what to expect. Um, and uh, what we find is often uh, helpful uh, within the scope of a course tour or meet the instructor video is if the uh, instructor kind of highlights why what they're learning in the course is important uh, for their uh, development, uh, particularly within the course of the program. Uh, and then if you're able to take that and maybe connect that with the next item, uh, if you create a discussion form uh, throughout the course, uh, you can have, we usually use kind of a couple kinds. Uh, the first would be kind of an introduction discussion forum uh, where we invite students to introduce themselves. So that way they get a chance to kind of have that water cooler conversation uh, where 
In a physical classroom, they might bump into each other, start uh, conversation organically. So we're trying to kind of replicate that type of experience where they get to meet each other, get to know each other a little bit, and kind of build that comfortability in terms of uh, that sense of being able to collaborate and grow and learn together as a group. Uh, the second type of discussion forum that we create um, it might be like a weekly discussion forum uh, with intentional discussion prompts where they have to post their own response and then reply to uh, like, let's say two of their peers is a common way to do it. Um, so there's some uh, strategies that uh, go along with that uh, that we'll discuss a little bit further, uh, both from the instructor side and also for uh, prompting students uh, on the student side uh, to increase engagement. So we'll cover that a little bit more specifically in a moment. The scheduling of synchronous virtual office hours. Uh, this is important because a lot of the online learning uh, may, uh, often takes place asynchronously. So essentially students are dropping in uh, on their own time around uh, work and life uh, commitments. Um, so the synchronous virtual office hours are uh, essentially a time that the uh, you've indicated students can schedule a meeting time with you or they can join collectively as a group. <laughs> Excuse me. They can join collectively as a group <clears throat> to cover uh, questions related uh, to the content or course material or clarify their understandings. Uh, if they have questions. Uh, so this kind of creates like the same sense of office hours that you might have as an in-person faculty, you know, on campus. Uh, that they can still engage with you and still uh, come and ask you questions and feel that they are supported as a learner. Um, we encourage uh, posting announcements to support learners throughout the learning process. Uh, so these can range from kind of like weekly reminders of uh, maybe it's kind of uh, reminding them of what's coming up in the week, particularly related to major assignments. So that way you're kind of helping to build that student success, uh, reminding them that that's coming and they can plan. Um, it could be that maybe uh, when they submitted their assignments, you're kind of seeing some common themes in terms of uh, misunderstanding. So maybe it's you're posting announcement, Maybe it, maybe it contains a, a, a brief video you recorded to kind of clarify some of those misunderstandings that you saw for the collective group. And even if it's like a small handful of students, a lot of times they often have the same questions. So posting an announcement is kind of a good way to make that available for everybody because it could help the entire group as well. And then uh, another way, uh, another critical component of creating instructor presence is providing timely, specific, and detailed feedback to students. Uh, so essentially, feedback that lets them know, uh, and a lot of times if this is aligned with the rubric, it can be helpful uh, if you connect it back to that rubric, but also provide specific examples. Um, and uh, clarify for them uh, where maybe some of the expectations were not met and give them opportunities to consider for improvement uh, for the next time. Uh, so essentially, we don't want the feedback to be too short or too ambiguous that they can't tell essentially uh, what they might need to do to grow or master, uh, essentially reach the learning objectives that we set for them in the module and uh, in the course. So the types of online interaction that we often see uh, within the course um, are the student to content, the student to student, and the student to instructor. So this aligns with how we are talking about uh, the different lenses in terms of uh, the social presence, the cognitive presence, and the teaching presence. Uh, so as we're kind of thinking about these types of online in interactions within the course, uh, we need to make sure that we're uh, promoting active learning uh, through these types of online interactions. And uh, this is critical because uh, we want to remove the uh, kind of that traditional model of where it's kind of passive and we're lecturing. Uh, so as we progress through the next uh, series of slides, I want you to kind of start thinking about uh, maybe the content that you might teach and uh, how you can actually uh, 
design that as an active learning experience in the online space for students and kind of replicate maybe some of the same ideas and concepts that you would do in class, some of the same types of assignments. So this diagram uh, shows uh, kind of the difference between active learning versus passive learning. And this is the reason why we try to emphasize active learning over passive learning. Um, you can see that there's a, a distinction between what people are able to remember um, and what they're able to actually demonstrate, apply, and do, or analyze, define, create, and evaluate uh, between active and passive learning. So in general, people remember 70% uh, of what they say and write, uh, which is a component of active learning, and 90% of what they do, uh, which is why uh, I mentioned earlier, we really kind of want to stay in that top part of the period with the analyze, define, create, and evaluate, because this is more of our active learning space. So the five main pedagogical approaches uh, that we consider within the online uh, space, uh, and just kind of a quick clarification here, um, you know, some of you may have heard of different learning theories and instructional design models, uh, and if so, you may be familiar with maybe some other learning theories such as behaviorism, for example. Um, so uh, these particular uh, five pedagogical approaches are kind of the, some of the main foundational ones. They're not the only, uh, but they're kind of the main foundational ones most commonly used as a starting point. And then depending on uh, the nature of your learning goal and what students need to be able to do, by the end of the course, you may pull in additional frameworks or specific uh, pedagogies uh, to help uh, build upon this framework. So we'll cover uh, these five. So when we refer to constructive, the constructivist approach, uh, we're actually um, putting students in the uh, driver's seat here, where we want them to be at the center of the process of understanding, uh, co-creating and gaining knowledge. Uh, so we're looking to encourage that critical thinking and also building upon uh, their engagement with you, their engagement with the content and engagement with other students uh, to encourage critical thinking and connecting those ideas and experiences from those different modalities. In the collaborative approach, uh, we may use something like having learners work together in groups. Uh, they may be focused, uh, they might be working on an assignment or uh, maybe a project-based learning item around solving a problem. Uh, they're building strategies, uh, a product, maybe they're completing specific tasks or creating ideas. Uh, so usually this is primarily collaborative amongst the students themselves. Uh, there may be some assignments where it might be beneficial for them to have some faculty guidance early on. Um, maybe one idea might come to mind is, uh, for example, kind of a capstone course. Uh, if they're building a capstone project, uh, you know, there's probably, it's probably a good idea for them, if they're collaborating as a team, to have some faculty check-in milestones along the way where they can get some feedback, adapt, and iterate based upon that experience. In the reflective approach, uh, we're leveraging student evaluation and analysis. So some strategies connected to this uh, might include, uh, maybe we have them write like a weekly reflection journal where they kind of recap. Uh, we could give them a uh, specify like a measurable number of things that we want them to uh, consider. Uh, you know, maybe we ask them to uh, kind of share like the two things that they uh, found most helpful for them, uh, maybe what they learned the most, maybe two of their muddiest or uh, stickiest points that was hard for them to understand. Um, and then that also provides an opportunity for the instructor to give them some feedback, uh, individual feedback, uh, if that was done through like, let's say a reflection journal. Um, so those are, uh, that's one way that you can uh, do this. Uh, reflection could also, uh, on the individual level, maybe include uh, in tandem with collaborative uh, in a way, uh, depending on how you wanted to use this as an instructor, 
I, you could actually use the Socratic method. Um, this could be on the individual level with the student where you're trying to extend their thinking. So uh, it might be that you tell them, you know, they had a good point, but then you challenge them with a question uh, for them to consider uh, extending their knowledge. Inquiry-based learning. Uh, so here, instead of the instructor uh, actually answering uh, questions for students directly, it might be that you're encouraging them to answer the question themselves. Uh, so it could be that they're working together. Uh, this could be blended with one of the other approaches. They're working together on a project, or it could be an individual assignment. Either way, uh, these approaches can be used in tandem. Um, where essentially they're figuring out how to get to that question, uh, how to answer that question themselves. Uh, so you might set up a kind of a um, series of assignments or prompts that help them get to address that question. Uh, we can almost kind of think of a research question in a way uh, as a form of inquiry-based learning. For the integrative approach, uh, we're actually bringing together usually a series of um, separate subjects, but kind of doing it through an interdisciplinary lens where we're creating a series of integrated lessons and trying to get students to make connections across these areas. Uh, so there may be some use cases where um, this could be beneficial, particularly if it's a field that might uh, blend some interdisciplinary knowledge or maybe they're specializing in one body of knowledge, but you're also trying to get them to kind of look at it from some other perspectives um, to uh, kind of uh, create more of a holistic uh, systems approach, uh, systems thinking approach. So this could be another approach that you bring in. Um, I think overall, uh, we see this one a little bit less compared to the others. So I want to uh, allot some time uh, for a practice scenario um, and also Q&A. Um, for this practice scenario, uh, I will preface, we're kind of doing this a little bit counter just for the sake of maybe giving uh, some practice for objectives. Um, where uh, typically when we design an online experience, we're kind of starting with our course outcomes and our objectives in mind. Uh, in this particular case, uh, just so that way, uh, for anybody who would like a little bit of practice, I wanted you to get a feel for um, <clears throat> what uh, writing objectives uh, for this scenario might look like. And uh, it is okay uh, to uh, just toss out ideas in the chat, or if you wish to uh, share verbally, that's perfectly fine too. So here's our practice scenario. Uh, let's pretend you are designing online physics module. The module includes lessons on Newton's law of motion or action reaction forces, the stress structural materials endure with opposite tension or compression, vibration and resonance. You have an idea for an assignment, applying these concepts to bridges. For this assignment, you're considering asking students to work in groups to identify a bridge that failed, explain why it failed, and calculate what load or stress combination would have appro been appropriate for the bridge. So if you were the faculty uh, in this scenario, uh, what might be an example of an objective that you would come up with? Would anyone like to share? So we can think of, uh, in this particular assignment, uh, if you remember the uh, pyramid that I showed you where we're looking for like apply, uh, create, evaluate. Um, so in this particular assignment, uh, you know, we could have multiple objectives in here where, uh, and maybe it's helpful if I uh, go back uh, to the pyramid for a moment for everyone to take a look at.
so if we're looking for them to apply, uh, so essentially they are going to apply elements of physics to this assignment. So uh, in this case, they actually need to interpret uh, why the bridge failed. Um, they need to actually analyze what caused it to fail, uh, what types of uh, stress uh, they're going to have to figure out based on the particular bridge that they selected as a group um, to base their problem around. Uh, they'll have to figure out what the materials were, the size of the beams and girds that were used, and figure out uh, what the calculations would be for the appropriate load that that bridge could hold. Uh, so these are some examples that they'll uh, use to then evaluate uh, what that bridge should have been able to support um, and create their idea around uh, how the bridge could have properly uh, functioned to support, you know, X number of materials um, based on the different principles of physics and the uh, stressors that may be occurred through opposite tensions uh, on the force of the bridge. So let me go back to where we were for one moment. So based on this scenario and the five pedagogical approaches that we covered, um, what examples of pedagogical approaches do you see in this scenario? Collaborative, reflective, great. I definitely see that. Uh, they're working in groups. They have to reflect on uh, what happened, why that bridge failed. Thank you. I appreciate those thoughts. Anyone else see some other ideas? Or do Integrate, we agree? Integrative. Because there, there, are many, there are many physics in, the, in this story about vibration on one side and stress and, and analysis on the other side. Integrative is definitely important. Great, great feedback. Uh, I love that. I love that you were able to pull that out of the scenario as well. So you can see how you can actually uh, engage multiple pedagogical approaches. Uh, I see another item in the chat, inquiry-based, as it started with a question that they needed to answer. Perfect. That's a great thought as well. Uh, so you can see that this is a very uh, creative way of doing the assignment. Uh, I did kind of break our rule of we didn't start with the objective first. I uh, challenged the group to uh, practice how you might write one uh, for this scenario, um, uh, just to make sure we had a little bit of practice here. Uh, so I appreciate all of the uh, responses. Those were great thoughts. So we have about uh, 15 minutes left. So uh, here's my contact information and I'll open it up for question and answers. Um, I was trying to position this because I knew we only had an hour together. Uh, there's a lot more content we could go into, but I wanted to kind of give you the foundation of what I thought would be uh, most useful for you.